turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. This morning we come to the third letter that Jesus writes to these seven churches. And once again, these are seven actual churches in the first century. We've also seen how the Lord chose these seven churches because of the important lessons that we can all learn as we uh, go through these letters. And he has things to say to not only the church back then, but church throughout its history to all of us, because he says to every one of them, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to these churches. So Jesus will address issues and problems in these seven letters that have existed throughout the history of Christianity. We've also seen that these seven churches represent seven various stages of the church down through its history. We've seen that even the names of the seven churches Jesus picks are significant because, again, some of these, there's no letters written to most of these churches. Uh, Ephesus is the only one that Paul wrote a letter to. Uh, Some of these churches were small and insignificant, but there were big churches, more powerful churches that he didn't choose, but he chose these, again, specifically to tell us what he does tell us in these letters. Um, For example, the first letter that we saw was the church to Ephesus. The name significant, it means desired ones. And we saw that Jesus desired their love. He says, I have this one thing against you. You're doing everything great, but you've left your first love. So he tells them, remember where you've fallen, repent, and then do the first works. Get back into that right relationship with Jesus Christ. That represents the first century church. Well, right after and even towards the end of the first century, persecution started coming into the church. In fact, from 64 AD to 311 or so AD, there was about 250 years of severe persecution where 10 Roman emperors, starting with Caesar Nero all the way through Diocletian, uh, they slaughtered about 6 million Christians during that time. So Smyrna, Jesus talks about the heavy persecution they're under, Smyrna gets its name from the their chief export of the city was myrrh. And myrrh is an, a, a fragrance that you, you get out of this plant by crushing it and grinding it up. And then it produces this resin-like substance. It was also used as one of the gifts given to the child, Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It predicted his death. And so that church, very significant with the name Smyrna, was a heavy-duty persecuted church. But it's also speaking to everybody that's been persecuted down through the ages. So now we come to this third letter to the church of Pergamos. Pergamos would represent a time frame around 313 A.D. to about 500 A.D. It's an actual church in the first century, but again, it signifies what's going on after the persecution stops. Pergamos means thoroughly married or bad marriage or, you know, different names for it. In, in your Bibles, it probably has a headline, the, um, the Compromising Church, because they were a very compromising church. Um, what happened in 313 AD? Well, Constantine, the emperor, issues what's called as the Edict of Milan, and it was taken after the Edict of Tolerance that this... Uh, short-lived emperor called Galerius in 311 started writing this edict to eliminate persecution against Christians. And then uh, Constantine took it further in 313, and he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so almost overnight, Christians go from being heavily persecuted and put to death for their faith, to being elevated to this place of prominence and authority. And so with the emperor's blessing, the the Lord's church becomes a political powerhouse. So what could be wrong with that? Uh, We'll see there was a lot wrong with that. Uh, Again, Pergamos gives us a hint where some of the the problems started. Um, With his edict of tolerance, the Lord's bride, his church, becomes thoroughly married to the world and and the government system around it. At the same time, Constantine's edict started forcing unbelieving pagans to come into the church. 
you can't force people into the kingdom of God. You know, Islam will put a sword to your throat, you know, say Allah is God and we'll let you live. If you deny that, we'll kill you. You can't do that with Christianity. You can't do that with Jesus. During the Crusades later on, and we'll look into some of that next time, Lord willing, with Thyatira, they started forcing people to become Christians by the edge of the sword. It doesn't work. It's not God's plan. He's given us free will. He says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Remember what Joshua said. You can choose the gods of the, the Amorites, or you can choose the living God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the problem with forcing pagans to become Christians is instead of repenting and turning to Christ, they just brought in all their pagan idols. They brought in all their pagan practices. And this is when the church really becomes corrupt. And again, that's part of why they're called the compromising church. Historically, you know, again, it goes for about 200 years to about 500 A.D. Many man-made doctrines came into the church at this time that are still being practiced today. And this is when the church was unequally yoked together with the paganism of the Roman Empire. So it, it represents a church that is very worldly, very compromising. By the way, this is the very reason the Apostle Paul gives such strong warnings to another carnal church, the church of Corinth. Remember what he wrote to the Corinthians, and this applies to Pergamos. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 17, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? You know, we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. You know, we're to be light and salt in the world, but we don't let the world, you know, snuff out the light. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So keep that in mind as we go through this letter to the church of Pergamos. Picking up chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus says, again, he's writing these seven letters to these seven churches. The apostle John is the one who dictates this. He's on the island of Patmos as a political prisoner. He writes this around 96 AD. And he says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, and we've already talked about the word angelos for angel, literally means messenger. John the Baptist is called an angelos. So I think Jesus is writing this to the, 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 you know, the bishop or the pastor of these churches. Be that as it may, he's writing to the church in Pergamos, and he says, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, anytime a church or an individual Christian begins to compromise in their walk with Jesus Christ, it's always in direct proportion to how much they are compromising the Word of God. If you're willing to compromise the Word of God, you will begin to compromise your walk with Jesus Christ. To say it another way, instead of believing that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation period is God's only source of truth, and that every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, they will start to wrongly believe that the Bible contains some truth, but there's truth found in all types of religions and all other philosophies, and we just need to bring all these different truths together and marry them. It doesn't work. God, God's word alone is the source of God's truth. So they no longer hold fast to the authority of Scripture. They no longer believe that the Bible is God's holy and living word. And so they start believing what is true for you well, it might not be true for me. Or they believe relativism. Truth is relative. What's true for you may not be true for me. In other words, you think Jesus is the only way to heaven? But I think there are many roads that will get you to heaven. We'll see at the end of Revelation, all roads lead to the great white throne. And you don't want to go there. 
There's only one road that leads to the Bema Seat of Christ, the place of rewards, and that's through Jesus Christ. Again, that's such a lie from the enemy that all roads will get you to heaven, but Satan is the one who is certainly attacking the truth of God's Word, especially in these last days. Unfortunately, we're seeing his lies permeating many churches all around us today. Uh, even so, you know, so-called Christians are saying, well, that's just being too narrow-minded to say Jesus is the only way to heaven. Or they'll say things like, you know, you're just being too judgmental, saying God doesn't approve of my immoral, sinful lifestyle. That's not true. I'll tell people when they say, you know what, you're just judging me. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm trying to be a biblical Christian who's warning you in love not to go against the word of God. Because God will come against you, as he mentions here, with the sword of the Spirit, that sharp two-edged sword, which is the Word of God. That's what he tells us here. It's the uncompromising, living, powerful Word of God that proceeds from the mouth of Jesus. In chapter 19, when he returns, riding on the white horse, we're following him. He strikes the enemy of God, the enemies, the nations, with a sharp two-edged sword that proceeds from his mouth. Jesus is the author of, he's the embodiment of the Word of God. So check out this verse, Hebrews 4.12, very familiar. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Speaking of the spiritual uh, armor that we're to wear, you know, at the end of that section in Ephesians six 17, we're to put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So right at the beginning of this letter, Jesus comes against this compromising church. It's compromising the word of God. He comes against them with the sharp two edged sword of the word of God. The only remedy for those who are listening to false teachings who are living in sinful lifestyles, is to confront them with the word of God, his word of truth. So look at verse 13. First of all, as he does with most of the churches, he gives them a commendation, and then he'll rebuke them. So first comes the commendation. Even in this church, he finds something to commend them about. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Again, he knows our works. That's a good thing, <laughs> and it's also a bad thing. Depends on how you're living your life. You know, he knows you can't fool God. To me, that's that's reassuring to know. He knows everything about me, so I don't need to pretend with God. I don't need to try to put on a happy face when I'm not happy or try to pretend I'm walking in righteousness when I'm not. I mean, you just be open and honest with the Lord. He sees all. He knows all. He wants us to be open and honest with him. And I can trust that he wants the very best for me as his son. And I can also cast all my cares upon him, knowing that he cares for me, knowing that he cares for you, just lay it at the foot of the cross. If there's something that's causing you to stumble, something that you're struggling with, he cares for you. Then he says here in verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now this will bring up a couple interesting points. Although the the ancient Pergamo city was a stunningly beautiful city, it was also one of the chief uh, leading worshipers of the emperors. It was a, a very wicked pagan city. It, it was beautiful. They had the second largest library outside of Alexandria, Egypt. And it was also the, one of the most uh, carnal, worldly cities of all time. For 400 years, it was a, a capital city. Um, they had what is known as the Acropolis. It's still there. And at the time, it was a thousand feet high. What was an Acropolis? Well, if you go to Israel with us, you'll, you'll see these different places like Tel Dan. A Tel is a mound, or Tel Aviv, it's a mound. In other words, when one thing was destroyed, like a city or a village, they would just build on top of it. And over the years, it kept getting bigger and bigger. 
So the Acropolis there in Pergamos was a thousand feet high. In other words, they had all these pagan temples. They'd rub, you know, turn to rubble. They'd build on top of them and keep building, building, building. Thousand feet high, and the most famous one was called the Temple to Zeus or the Altar of Zeus. Very ornate. It was one of the largest altars ever built. It was over 80 feet high, 117 feet wide, and it was 110 feet deep. It looked like a giant throne. In fact, this altar of Zeus was one of the uh, seven, seven wonders of the ancient world. I mean, it was pretty spectacular. On the steps leading up to this massive throne, they had this platform about two-thirds, three-fourths of the way up the steps. There was this big platform, and on top of it, they had this huge, hollow bronze bull and it had you know whole it was hollow they'd put sacrifices humans in the back of it and close it up they'd start a fire under it and they would roast people alive and that person that was being roasted alive they were called the holocaust keep that in mind in a moment you'll see why this is important because um, we'll see Antipas he was a faithful martyr he was probably put in that bull set on fire and they'd had these holes cut out, the nostrils and the mouth, and you'd hear the people inside, and the sound would funnel through this large bronze cow. And it was just very, very pagan to the core. Antipas became a Holocaust victim at that time. Notice it also says here in verse 13, And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Even though the, the, the corruption was quickly flooding this church, there's always a remnant. There's always those who did not bow their knee to Baal or to the emperor, or to any of these pagan gods, and they stayed faithful to Jesus Christ. They refused to bow their knee to these pagan leaders and idols. Um, they didn't deny the fact that there is only one King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and that's Jesus himself. So they held fast to the truth of God's word and the doctrines of the faith, which notice Jesus calls my faith. This is his faith. We don't make up Christian faith. We don't make up Christian doctrine. This is the Lord's Bible. This is his doctrine. This is what he gives to us. And so some were staying faithful to the true uh, truth of God's word. Now, notice he also mentions this guy Antipas. His name is significant. His name means against all. That's a cool name to have. He was against all. In other words, he's against all the wickedness, all the paganism. He was against all the, the sexual immorality, the idolatry. He was against it all, and he was not going to compromise his faith and, and you know, getting caught up in all the deceitful doctrines that the pagans were bringing into the church. Eventually, it cost him his life. Um, back in Revelation 1, verse 5, that's where Jesus is called the faithful witness. Those are the exact same words used of Antipas when it says faithful martyr. Faithful witness, faithful martyr, the Greek word for witness and martyr is the same. It's martis. And they became synonymous terms because if in this time frame, if you were a faithful witness of Jesus Christ, more often than not, you would become a faithful martyr of Jesus Christ. You remember what uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, last thing Jesus says before he ascends up into heaven, he tells his disciples, but you shall receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, he's always in us at salvation, but he wants to come upon us, empowering us to live out his life, uh, the life he has for us. And you shall be, notice, witnesses to me. The word witnesses is martyrs. In other words, we are to be living martyrs for Jesus Christ, dead to ourselves, alive to Jesus. In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And as you know, there are many examples in the New Testament of followers of Jesus Christ being martyred for their faith. First one was Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He's martyred for his faith. And then the first apostle was James. You know, he was put to death for his faith. And then we see others. And, and we know around 68 AD, um, the apostle Paul and Peter were both killed outside of Rome for their faith in the Lord. Um, Paul suffered greatly because of his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
let's go back to this uh, phrase here. He says, where Satan's throne is. Does Satan have a literal throne on earth? Well, that's interesting because there's a lot of, you know, uh, Apostle John says there are many antichrists in the world today. There is a coming antichrist, but there are many antichrists. Uh, the near the Caesars, they were like a type of antichrist. And anywhere that those who are opposing Jesus are, I think Satan's throne is nearby. I don't think it's a literal you know, throne that he sits on, but it's his place of authority. Back then, I think it was Pergamos. It was the place where Satan's throne is, as he mentions here. Um, Satan can only be in one place at one time. He's a created being. But uh, it, it's very interesting that the altar of Zeus, Jesus refers to as the, the throne of Satan. Over time, that throne got covered up with more rubble, and though it was, it was pretty much intact. And in fact, in 1864, uh, this German archaeologist slash, slash architect named Karl Hohmann came to Turkey. He came specifically to Pergamos, and he gets permission from the Turkish government to excavate on the Acropolis. And to his surprise, he uncovers the throne of Satan, the throne of Zeus, the altar of Zeus. And over the next 22 years, he dismantles it bit by bit, and he brings it. That's that is the altar of Zeus from Pergamos. And by over 22 years, stone by stone, he takes it to Berlin, Germany. And that is in it's called the Museum of the Island in Berlin, Germany. And that is the altar of Zeus. It took uh, another almost 30 years to complete putting it all back together. So in 1930, they dedicate this in Berlin, Germany, the altar of Zeus. And significantly, because that's 1930, they open it up to the public. By the way, you can go there. Eh, they're, it's closed right now. So if any of you are still around after the rapture, they're going to reopen that in 2024. I'm not setting a date, by the way. <laughs> but they're going to dedicate it, and I'll have it open again in 2024. So they build, they redo this. I mean, that thing is weird. It's crazy. So in three years after this, Germany votes in a new chancellor, right? Adolf Hitler, 1933. And he has this, one of his best friends, another architect named um, Albert Speer. He um, wants him to build him a huge stage altar um, that would, mes and in his words, mesmerize the people of Germany. And so Albert Speer, he studied this, he's checked it out. He builds an exact replica of this in Nuremberg, Germany. And that's where, if you see these um, pictures of Hitler, when there's hundreds of thousands of people gathered, they got all the lights shooting up behind him. He's on the stage that was replicated after this, the throne of Satan. And it was September 15th. 1935, he gives his Nuremberg Law speech, and that's the first mention of his final solution. That's when he is going to destroy the Jewish people. Instead of putting them in a calf, bronze, to be a holocaust, he would put them in gas ovens, and six million Jews would die during the holocaust. Many of them put into gas ovens. So I would say at that moment... That was probably the seat of Satan when Hitler was, you know, proclaiming all of his wickedness and madness from that altar there. The only thing still left in Nuremberg is the platform where he spoke from. And it's like the top of that, the, the sides are gone, but that platform is still there in Nuremberg today. The only thing that remains from that massive stage that they built. Be that as it may, where is Satan's throne today? Ah, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, there's so much wickedness and corruption in the world today. It, 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 I think Satan and his demons know time is short. And so who knows where it is. But Satan is always roaming the world like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So it's no mystery. Satan knows his time is short, so he's stealing, killing, and destroying as many lives as possible. So Jesus has just given them... <laughs> 
I didn't give it to you, but he just gave them a commendation, the good news. Now he's going to rebuke them for allowing bad doctrine to enter into their church. Look at verse 14. So last week I said it, this week I'll say it. These are not happy, happy, joy, joy messages, are they? I mean, these are tough, but this is the Lord Jesus Christ warning and, you know, giving us important things to heed. But I have a few things against you, talking about the church of Pergamos, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now part of his commendation to the church of Ephesus was they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says, I also hate. What were the deeds of the Nicolaitans? It comes from two Greek words, Nikeo, laetis. Nikeo means to conquer the laity. And so they were putting hierarchy over the people. Even in the first century, these different bishops, and they turn into priests later on. They were putting themselves above the people. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I'm not to get between you and the Lord. You know, no priest or anybody get between you and the Lord. But that's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Jesus hates that when somebody tries to get in the way between you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. So here he also mentions um, something else that he is, says is not acceptable, and that is the, the deeds uh, or the doctrine of Balaam. This tells me a couple of things. First of all, biblical doctrine is very important. He mentions doctrine twice here. You find the word doctrine, didache in the Greek, or didache, didache, it means doctrine or teaching. It's found 50 times in the New Testament alone. We are warned about false doctrine. We are encouraged to stay in sound doctrine. In the last days, they'll say, people will accumulate for themselves teachers that will tickle their own ears. They're not holding fast to sound doctrine. So doctrine is important to the Lord. But again, doctrine, you know, Theology, it's always to bring us into a closer relationship with Jesus. It's not about how much head knowledge can I accumulate, but it's, are these things drawing me closer to the Lord? Now, the early church was built on the doctrines and teachings of Christ as taught by the apostles. Look at this verse, Acts 2.42. You're all familiar with this. Uh, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's Didache, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. I, I've said this for many years now, that as followers of Jesus Christ, we must have two things working within our lives in order to maintain a balanced walk with Jesus. And number one is we need to walk in God's love. Right? We all want to be loving. We, want to, we have to walk in God's love. Number two is we need to be walking in God's truth. You cannot separate those. They, they have to be together. They have to go hand in hand. In fact, you can write these down. Ephesians 4.15, Paul says, We must speak the truth in love. And then in 2 John verse 1, John says, I love in truth. And so they are very, very important. We need that biblical balance that's only achieved as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's another old saying that says, truth without love is harshness, but love without truth is compromise. This is the compromising church. Yeah, there may be a lot of love and acceptance in that church, but they were compromising the truth of God's word. If we just go around speaking truth, but God's love is not behind what we say, we are going to come across as bitter and angry and judgmental towards the people that we're talking with, and they'll quickly tune you out. I mean, I've done it. I think we've all done it. We want to speak that truth. I got to tell that person where they're wrong. And we come across, again, bitter, angry, judgmental. It's not going to fly. There's no love in that. That's compromise. So at the same time, we have to not go around and appease everybody and everything they say and accept everything they say when it contradicts the Word of God because love without truth is compromise. So that is what was happening in this church of Pergamos. It began compromising God's word 
to such an extent that they're allowing and tolerating all this sinful behavior, all these, you know, they're condoning wicked lifestyles. But never forget, it was Jesus who said, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says of God's word, my word is truth. Jesus is the one who said, I've come to bear witness to the truth. You can't separate truth and love. So who are we to say, well, I don't believe in absolute truth, or truth is whatever you want it to be, or truth is relative. Be careful. You know, he talks about the doctrine of Balaam. What was the doctrine of Balaam that they were tolerating? Well, he rebukes this church because they've embraced the doctrine of Balaam. The story is found in the book of Numbers. It was when Moses and the Israelites are coming through um, present-day Jordan, through the land of Moab, on their way to the promised land. And as they're coming through there, King Balak, the king of Moab, is very, very upset. He's worried about the Israelites coming through his territory. And so he hires a prophet, which is kind of an oxymoron. You, can't, you don't hire prophets. There's a lot of false prophets today that love to be hired. We just had one out here on Patterson Road at the church there at the top of the hill. $25,000 to get this guy to speak for an hour. That's what they pay him to come in. And he comes in every few years. He's a false prophet. He's the one that said a few years ago, God told me I'm to get this $62 million private jet. There's a lot of those. Anyway, charlatans out there. So be careful. Be that as it may. That was off topic. Um, King Balak. You know, he hires Balaam, this prophet, and he wants him to pronounce a curse against the Israelites. And so he's like, eh, I don't think this is going to work, but okay. He wanted the money because he says, I'll give you lots and lots and lots of money if you will curse the Israelites. So he goes up on a high mountain. He tries to pronounce a curse. Every time he tried, he did this three times. Every time he tries to pronounce a curse, God filled his heart with a blessing towards the Israelites. And so now King Balak is mad and he wants to curse the Jews. King Balaam, Balaam is mad because, not king, the false prophet Balaam's mad because he wants the money. And so here's the doctrine of Balaam that he says, okay, God won't let me curse them because they're under his umbrella, his blessing. But here's what you can do, king, to get them to remove themselves from the covering of God, remove themselves from God's blessing send in all these Moabite women of yours into the camp of the Israelites and let them know this is how we worship our gods here in Moab. And so they started practicing idolatry, sexual immorality, and we're told in numbers that 23,000 Israelites were put to death in one day because of their rejection of God and their embracing the doctrine of Balaam we're told, uh, Paul tells us 24,000 died in that incident because 23,000 in one day and then another thousand over the next coming days. But God struck them down. Sure enough, it worked. But Balaam, did he get away with his you know, money? Did he get to spend his money? No. He leaves thinking, oh, wow, I got my donkey full of money now and I'm going to be living high in the hog and and he goes and visits the Midianites and is at this time when God tells Moses I want you to attack the Midianites they had five kings there and this is what it says look at this verse in Numbers 31 verse 8 guess who's hanging out with these kings of Midian Balaam the prophet so the Israelites they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with what? The sword. The sword. How appropriate. You remember what Jesus, how he started this letter? These things says him, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. When all is said and done, those who twist God's word will face the sharp two-edged sword of the Lord. And so the doctrine of Balaam is uh, that Jesus comes against is when people who know the truth, 
Many of these false teachers around us, they know the truth, but they misrepresent the truth of God's word by telling people what their flesh wants to hear instead of what God's word actually says. That's the doctrines of Balaam. And we're seeing so many churches, especially in our nation, that are falling for these lying, false teachings of the world that tickle people's flesh, that tell you it's okay to live this lifestyle. God thinks, you know, you're, you're okay living in sin, living in immorality. Be careful. That's the doctrine of Balaam. There is so much acceptance and toleration within the church today that people are now calling sinful behavior acceptable behavior. The problem with that is God does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is still the final authority on what is acceptable behavior and what is sinful behavior. And what he called sin 2,000 years ago is still sin today. What he called marriage in the Garden of Eden is still marriage today. It's a limited term that God says one man, one woman, that's marriage. The blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross is still the only payment for our sins. But to tell people you can live this way and you're okay with God is a lie from the enemy. You don't forget what Paul tells us in Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that he'll also reap. You sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh corruption. You sow to the spirit, you reap of the spirit life, everlasting life. The Lord's church has never been a democracy. It is the Lord's kingdom. He tells us, his subjects, what to do, how we are to live. It's never been, nor will it ever be, a place where we vote Jesus out. You understand that? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the head of his church, his body, and his, his word has the final say in all spiritual matters. We are, we, are, we are to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us God's ways and, you know, according to God's word. Never forget this. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Contrary to what John said, the Holy Spirit is not the cool spirit. You might be in a cool home fellowship. That's great. But the Holy Spirit is not the cool spirit. He's not the culturally relevant spirit. He is not the do whatever you want to do spirit. He is the Holy Spirit of God. And yet so many within the church are wanting to be so accommodating to the world around them that they're lowering the standards of our faith to make worldly people feel so at ease in their sin that they never are told to repent. They're never told get right with God. They're never told to turn from these things that are going to destroy your life. And so there's going to be a lot of people, unfortunately, that are going to stand before Jesus and he's going to say, well, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform all these signs and wonders in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You don't want to hear the Lord say that to you. You want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So when they just compromise the word of God, all that does is get Christians seduced into the mindset that grace means we can tolerate and accept whatever sinful lifestyle people are into. But when godly people try and call them out, you and I will be labeled, oh, you're a hater you're intolerant, you're unloving, you don't understand grace. And I say, oh, yes, I do. Jesus died for my sins to set me free from my sins. He didn't die so that I can continue to live in that sin, whatever that sin that you're living in is. That's not grace. Grace sets us free. Grace does not say, yeah, keep living that way. I don't care. God does care. So look at verse 16. Repent, and that's why you don't want to hear Jesus say, repent or else. That's a scary thought. Here he says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
In other words, Jesus loves us so much, he won't allow us to continue to live sinful, fleshly, compromising lives. Don't fall for the, the lies of Satan or Balaam's doctrine that says, as a Christian, we can live any way you want. God doesn't care. You can disobey God's word. There won't be any consequences. That's not true. Again, five of the seven churches Jesus writes letters to, he calls them to repent. Repentance, not just a one-time deal when you got saved. Repentance is anytime the Holy Spirit convicts you of something that's not right, you turn from that and you turn doing things God's way. Repentance, people, even Christians, make it seem like it's a dirty word. Oh, no, if I repent, that means I'm not fully in Christ. It's like, no, you're in Christ, but you're in the sanctification process. None of us are perfect yet. We still stumble. We still bumble around. And so we humble ourselves. We repent. we got to heed what the Lord tells us. Or else, he says, he will come against you with the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God. Verse 17 he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I've said this, again, for years. Anybody and everybody's welcome to Calvary Chapel. But a lot of people don't stay here because when you start calling out sin, they're like, you, you're judging me. No, it's like, no, I'm not. This is God's Word. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. If you want to reject the Holy Spirit's conviction through the Word of God, they will leave. I had a cousin years ago. She was into a lifestyle that was not godly. She came here for a year, and then she left because she went right back to that vomit. Nobody chased her out, but she was so convicted by the Holy Spirit, she wouldn't stay. But then unfortunately, she didn't repent. Very, very sad. But everybody's welcome here to hear the word of God, to hear the truth of God's word. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What a great promise. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So he gives two amazing promises here. First of all, he says, I'll give some of the hidden manna. Is that a great mystery? No. Who's the manna? Jesus. He's just saying, I'm going to give you more of myself. You're going to be in my presence forever and ever. That's the hidden manna. It's Jesus being with him forever. Look at these verses. This is what Jesus tells us in John 6, starting in verse 32. Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, we will always be satisfied in Jesus Christ. We will always be growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first promise. He's the hidden manna. Here's the second promise. Notice what he says here. He'll give you a white stone with a new name on it that nobody knows except for him who receives it. You've heard of somebody being blackballed. You know, that it means they're kicked out. They're not accepted. That's where this comes from. The white stone, when they would vote on something, they would have a white stone and a black stone. If they found you innocent, you'd get a white stone. Or if you were accepted, you were given a white stone. If you were guilty of something, then they put a black stone out there. So Jesus is saying, because you're an overcomer, you've received him as your Lord and Savior, I'm giving you a white stone. I've accepted you. Like Paul says, you're accepted in the beloved. This stone is a stone of acceptance. You are going to be with me forever and ever. That is glorious. That's what he's promising to each one of us, a vote of confidence. If you're an overcomer, if you believed in me, if you receive me, then you have my vote of confidence and acceptance. And whatever new name he has for you, it's going to be glorious. It's not going to be whatever your name is now. And it's not just your, oh, Jeff. What's wrong with Jeff? Nothing. But he's got, he's got a better name. And, you know, we used to have that song where he says, I will change your name. I tried to quote it earlier, so Bethany gave me the, the words. 
Um, you shall no longer be called wounded, outcast, lonely, or afraid. You remember that song? Your new name shall be confidence, joyfulness, overcoming one, faithfulness, friend of God, one who seeks my face. Instead of being called loser, no, Jesus says, you're my child. You know, whatever that new name is, it's going to be glorious, cherished, forgiven, saved. Let me just close with this very familiar verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Praise the Lord. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Walk in that newness of life that Jesus gave to you and me and just enjoy walking in fellowship with him. If you're entangled with the things of this world, now's the time to say, Lord, I give it to you. I cast this at your feet because I know it's wrong. I know this is sin. I know it hurts my family. It hurts my relationship with you, Jesus. So I lay it down at the foot of the cross. I repent of that and experience the, the joy of the Lord. Experience the joy of your salvation. Remember what King David said when he, after he sinned with Bathsheba, part of Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy of of your salvation. If you don't have that joy this morning, then there's something in the way. You got to get it out there, give it to the Lord, and let Him fill you up, overflowing with rivers of living water.